I've heard that song before, hmm. but I can't quite remember its name. Oh, wait, I think I have something on my phone that may just do the trick. Let's try it out. Oh, so the song is called Clave. Although what I just demonstrated may be pretty straightforward, what you may not have noticed is the actual complex amount of machine learning that is actually running behind the scenes in order to perform this simple task. And that, in essence, is the subject of our talk. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on Remembrance Day. We are Cardiana Consulting, and the subject of our talk is anatomical intelligence, specifically how machine learning can be applied to medical imaging. My name is Sani, and joining me on stage is Fred, Justine, Nicola, and Nimisha. So before we begin our talk, it's first important to highlight the scope of our project. We seek to explain the fundamentals of machine learning and, and pattern recognition as they apply to the medical imaging field. And in doing so, we'll hopefully accomplish two objectives. Firstly, we want to demonstrate how machine learning can be applied to ultrasound imaging which is the subset of medical imaging. And, and in addition, we'd like to propose a strategy to, in order to increase adoption of an anatomically intelligent ultrasound system developed by, Physi uh, by Philips in the Canadian healthcare market. So a bit of an overview of the talk. Uh, we will first begin by uh, describing artificial intelligence and the different kinds of artificial intelligence. Next, we'll focus on machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. And one of the ways machine learning is done is through pattern recognitions, which is the uh, next section. And then we reach the main focus of our talk, which is anatomical intelligence. Anatomical intelligence is an ultrasound software that is able to do some automation based on pattern recognition. We'll discuss its advantages as well as how to increase adoption in the Canadian healthcare market. So artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence? So the scientific term is the emulation of intelligent behavior through perception, reasoning, action, and learning. So if you combine all those four concepts together, you come up with a purpose. So the purpose of AI is to actually automate intelligent tasks that humans would normally perform. So if you think about things you do every day, like when you go home, turning on and off your light switch, wouldn't it be nice if there was something that could do it for you as you walk into the room? So there are two different branches of AI. Firstly, the most famous one, I guess more uh, relevant in some sense, is hard artificial intelligence. And this type of intelligence seeks to replicate the full gamut of human intelligence to solve a broad or a very complex problem. So a really famous example is IBM's Watson, which some of you may know. Um, it's a supercomputer that played Jeopardy against human opponents and actually won. The other sort of branch of artificial intelligence is soft artificial intelligence. So this type of software seeks to replicate a subset of human intelligence to solve only a specific set of tasks or problems. And just going back to my example earlier, uh, one of these softwares would be Shazam, so the music recognition software. And as with any technology, disruptive or otherwise, it's important to think about the commercial implications. So in the context of our presentations, the relevant question would be how can artificial intelligence be implemented to develop useful tools in the medical imaging setting? So next off, just a brief overview of the different branches of artificial intelligence. So, so as you can see, there's lots of different subdisciplines, and each of these subdisciplines on their own have subfields. And of particular interest is machine learning. So a machine is set to learn if its performance uh, of a particular task improves over time and experience. So a human analogy would be something like riding a bicycle. So the first time you ride a bicycle, you tend to fall all the time. But as you keep practicing and going and riding a bicycle, chances are you'll fall less and less until you can fully ride a bike. And uh, in terms of a machine, one of the ways a machine or software can learn is through what's called pattern recognition, which is a branch of artificial of machine learning. And pattern recognition is the categorization of inputs based on the association of input variables and to their outputs. So next up, Fred will talk about machine learning. All right. 
So as Sandy mentioned, machine learning is uh, one branch of artificial intelligence, and it really focuses on how we can develop systems or program systems to really learn how to solve problems on their own. Uh, to contrast this, think of uh, one of your graph or your calculators. Uh, it is able to solve pretty complex mathematical functions, but the more you use it, it, uh, it doesn't really improve with experience. So uh, the field of machine learning is really the intersection of computer science, statistics, and brain function. So in computer science, uh, it's really the study of how computers work and how we can develop programs to basically solve complicated problems. In terms of uh, machine learning, we now sort of change this definition to how we can get uh, or program machines to basically program themselves. Uh, the study of statistics really looks at how data can be analyzed and how we can, um, uh, how we can uh, model data to basically draw inferences from the, the population. And so in machine learning, the, the focus is still on how we can apply these statistical models, but really there's a bigger emphasis on how we should organize the data to really draw the most uh, useful inf inferences. And in the study of brain function, we uh, really look at how or which processes uh, underlie knowledge and comprehension. And so how can we apply these processes that humans use to learn and uh, think and put them into a machine sort or setting to really design computers to learn on their own? So. How do machines learn? There are four major paradigms involved in machine learning, the first being memory. So the ability for the machine to store into its memory uh, information that, it is, uh, that it has been taught, and also to access that information for further uh, use. The second would be uh, learning by similarity. So imagine you show uh, the computer a picture of a car. Uh, now you show it a, a picture of a car that is slightly different. Is it still able to draw the conclusion that the second picture is also a car? Uh, third would be learning by example. So uh, if you were to tell the machine that the, uh, a car is able to move and transport people, uh, if you were to show it a, a, an airplane, would it still be able to draw that or make that generalization that both the car and the airplane are vehicles? And reinforcement. So say the machine makes a mistake. So if you were to, just using the previous example, uh, show it the picture of the car and then a, a, an office chair, which is also able to, like, to hold the person and they can move with the chair, but would it class, if it classifies the chair as a vehicle, then and you tell it that it's wrong, the next time that it tries to classify it, would it be able to uh, adapt and basically classify it as not a vehicle? And so there are two major, uh, major algorithms used in machine learning. The first is unsupervised learning, which is really trying to identify hidden patterns in an unlabeled data set. The second is supervised learning, which really uh, it, it tries to predict outcomes based on information that you've taught it to, uh, to use. So in unsupervised learning, let me give you a brief overview. What it means to be unsupervised is really that the program does not have a concept of the, what the right answer is. So in this sense, uh, the inputs that you give it are not associated with any output. So say in the top right corner here, you give it a set of raw data. For simplification, we've labeled them as uh, colored shapes, but the, the machine would not actually be given this, uh, this label. Uh, and now the learning part comes in where you tell it to really, to try to uh, group these inputs together and try to find patterns in the, the information. And the output that you might get from this is the clustering of the different shapes into, uh, to, into the shapes. So you would get a group of the circles, a group of squares, and a group of triangles. Uh, let me go a bit more into detail on one of the algorithms that, algorithms that is used in uh, unsupervised learning. So one of the most widely used algorithms used in uh, unsupervised learning is cluster analysis. And uh, it is defined as the grouping of inputs based on identified patterns or similarities in their variables. And so imagine you're given a data set of patient records. And in this data set, there, is, uh, there are only two factors, LDL cholesterol level and the body mass index of the patient. And so we have 14 inputs here with two factors each. What the algorithm would do, would, uh, it would plot these variables. And now, you would, now it would try to predict the groupings based on what you've told it. So, Imagine it uh, identifies these two clusters, the ones in the blue circle and the ones in the red circle. Uh, this is what you would get from the algorithm. So now looking back at what, how it has classified the in, or the outputs based on uh, what the factors were, you might identify that the, the inputs in the blue circle have a low risk of cardiovascular disease, whereas the ones in the red circle have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, just one example that you might have encountered in uh, one of in real life is Google News. So Google News actually uses a clustering algorithm to uh, group different news articles that have been published from many different sources throughout the day. So what it would take, it would take these news articles and classify them based on 
the type of story they are. So you would have top stories, world news, uh, Canadian news, and, for and sports, for example. Uh, if you were to like, click on the sports headlines, you might see them separated by the different type of sport that it, uh, that it falls under, the headline. Uh, and so one further example, like if you were to click on hockey now, uh, you might see, this is what the output would show you. So you might see the story that, uh, of a game that is happening uh, right now, actually. So the Penguins versus Rangers game. Uh, the output that is shown here is actually a conglomerated uh, output. So if you were to click on this story, you'd be able to look at the different sources that it has drawn these, uh, this information from. Another example of where cluster analysis is used is in market segmentation. So imagine you have a large group of uh, customer information or a large data set of customer information and you're trying to identify markets where you can target different customers or different groups that the customers fall into. Uh, you could use an unsupervised cluster, cluster analysis algorithm to identify these groups and then analyze or target them specifically later on. Uh, in contrast to unsupervised learning, there is supervised learning. So the difference here is that you are actually telling the program what the right answers are. So in the, similar to the example before, now you're telling it that the shapes, the, uh, uh, the data is associated with the color shape uh, shown at the top there. And this would become the labeled training set that you would use to teach the program to build a model. And so the results or the outputs of the model are the different colors of the shapes. And now imagine you have a new piece of information or a new input, and you're trying to predict the outcome of that. So you could use the, uh, the model that you have taught it to learn or taught it to build and feeding that new uh, information, uh, just the three lines and the color teal, it would predict that the output is in fact a green tr or a teal triangle. Uh, so let me give you an example of a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, this one would be a classification. And so classification is defined as the categorization of inputs based on the, associ the association of input variables and their output. So let's look back to that same example with the patient records. But now you've labeled the patients as either having cholesterol or cardiovascular disease or not having cardiovascular disease. What it would do now is you would use this information and train the model or train the algorithm to develop a model to predict whether, uh, how the outputs are associated with the inputs. So we would map the variables and it would maybe come up with a model like this. So it would determine a threshold where uh, any inputs that fall under that uh, dashed line are, uh, are labeled as having no cardiovascular disease and uh, inputs that, are, that fall above that line have cardiovascular disease. Now with this model, imagine you now have a new patient that comes in with this information. So they have uh, LDL uh, cholesterol level and a body mass index. Uh, now you want the algorithm to predict what the diagnosis might be for this patient. So you would map this, the variables of this uh, patient onto uh, your model. And based on the model that you have uh, produced or the machine has uh, learned, it would probably class, it would, it would actually classify it or the patient as not having CVD. So just to give you a brief overview, in unsupervised learning, you're taking a large data set and you're trying to identify patterns and groupings within the data of, of, the, of the inputs. Uh, this could be used to really uh, predict what the classifications are in the sense, if you don't really know what the labels are supposed to be. And uh, in, in contrast to this, there's supervised learning where you're, built, you're training the, the algorithm to learn, uh, to learn a model basically. And so what this would be used for is for predicting outputs based on pre-trained knowledge. Uh, we'll go into a bit more detail on how the models are, are on the different models that are used in uh, supervised learning. And for the remainder of this talk, we'll be looking only at supervised learning. Uh, as well, we'll talk more on how you could train the, the model to, re or the algorithm to develop a model. And I'll give it over to Justine to tell you a bit more on how machine learning is used in pattern recognition and more specifically medical imaging. So as Brett mentioned, the goal of unsupervised learning is to identify hidden patterns in an unlabeled data set, while supervised learning aims to minimize classification error by creating a model with generalization or predictive capabilities. For the purposes of our talk, we will continue on with supervised learning as it pertains to pattern recognition in medical imaging. I will provide an overview of pattern recognition, the main models used to train a pattern recognition system and then how these models can be trained to detect landmarks from various three-dimensional objects um, and classify them based on these landmarks. So what is pattern recognition? Pattern recognition can be defined by the categorization of input data into similar cl 
cla uh, similar classes by the extraction of characteristic features. There are many ways that a program can be designed to recognize patterns from a set of input data, but there are three models that are used most commonly. These models are regression, classification, and neural networks. All three of these examples are uh, involve supervised learning, and that can also be noted by the top right icon on the screen. So regression models are the most simplistic. It uses a set of training inputs, and then a linear or higher order regression can be computed to determine a correlation between the inputs and the outputs. It can be very effective when there's a small number of factors. However, this model tends to fail when a large number of factors are introduced with a more complex data set. Therefore, this model is not ideal in medicine, where there are many factors that play a part in producing a relationship. Secondly, classification represents one of the most widely used pattern recognition systems in medical imaging. It's able to handle a large number of factors to predict patterns, and after doing this, the inputs are assigned to specific classifications or categories. For example, if an input had the factors height, weight, age, gender, smoking status, etc. Uh, this model can assign the inputs to a diabetic or non-diabetic category. And finally, we have neural networks. Neural networks are one of the most powerful modeling methods and is another way to infer patterns from a set of data. It works by emulating the human brain, which means that inputs are passed through several layers of sequ sequential nodes, also called perceptrons, uh, with each connection between nodes assigned different weightings. It's able to model very complex nonlinear problems using incredibly complicated and extensive data sets. While it's able to process such a complex data set, the drawback of neural networks lies in the fact that they operate like a black box. So you feed it an input, it produces an output, but you have no way to track how the model's been adapted and how it's identifying patterns to predict this output. Therefore, of these three popular models used in pattern recognition, classification is the most suitable for our application. Not only can it predict or classify data based on a large number of factors, but it can be modeled in an iterative fashion whereby the investigator knows exactly how the model has been adapted after each step. So whether you realize it or not, pattern recognition has been integrated in our daily lives. For instance, in product recommendation, Amazon, for example, leverages customer insight data to teach the system to suggest products that a customer might be interested in. So this data could include items previous, previously purchased, items most frequently viewed, or even those items sitting in the shopping cart that have not yet been purchased. So a model is built to predict these patterns of behavior and ultimately outputs new product recommendation related to a customer's interest. The next example is in spam email filtering. So your email becomes smart in that it has been trained to recognize which emails are spam and which are not, and then filters it to the appropriate folder automatically. And finally, facial recognition is another uh, way a machine can recognize a pattern of unique facial features and then map these inputs to a particular person. Now what's common to all of these examples that might not be immediately apparent is that in all of these cases, a machine or computer system has been taught to infer relationships from data or to recognize patterns within it. So how does this look from a computer vision perspective? A computer recognizes distinct features of an object through a process called segmentation. Segmentation involves the breaking down an object's physical features in a way that it can be perceived by a computer. It matches the perceived pattern to a database of objects previously learned. So going back to the example of facial recognition, a computer converts these features into a pattern. So the machine first zeroes in on the features of interest, such as eyes, ears, mouth, or nose, and then it's further translated into angles of contrast, which fall within the grayscale. After these angles of contrast are, are converted into pixels, it is further computed into a sequence of numbers. So these numbers represent grayscale levels and can be considered the characteristic uh, pattern or fingerprint of this particular landmark of an object. So the lower number indicates a, a shade of gray closer towards the black end, and a higher number indicates a uh, shade of gray closer towards white. Three-dimensional objects that we encounter in our everyday life are complex in that they can't simply be uh, classified just based on one or two different landmarks. Therefore, we train machines to recognize a multitude of landmarks so that uh, 
the model can abstract relationships from all of these points and classify these objects appropriately. <clears throat> so let's visualize this concept of using multiple landmarks to classify an image. A pattern recognition system is taught through machine learning to detect landmarks or these ca characteristic fingerprint patterns. So these landmarks are visual attributes that significantly differ from surrounding image attributes. So it considers features such as color, contrast, luminance, and edge to make distinctions from one landmark to the next. Through supervised learning, you can train a machine to classify patterns of numbers which represent a particular landmark on an object. And the more landmarks you define, the more accurate the classification. So let's use this four-door sedan as an example. Let's assume that one strikingly unique feature of this car is its front right bumper. And it's unique in that it has a different shape, angle, or contour, et cetera, from other vehicles. So from a computer vision perspective, this part of the bumper is translated into the numerical sequence via the segmentation process. The numbers are indicative of the pixels, and so once again, the, number, the lower the number, the closer it is to the black shade of gray, and then the higher the number is closer it is to white. So this sequence or pattern of numbers is then compared to what the machine learned to be correct and then classifies the car accordingly. So typically, a decision to uh, categorize an object is based on the recognition of multiple landmarks. And once again, a greater number of characteristic landmarks results in a more accurate classification. So from a clinical perspective, we can apply these same concepts to train a machine to recognize anatomical features in the body. Each organ has characteristic landmarks that are common from one person to the next, assuming that they develop normally from birth. So therefore, a machine can be trained to recognize these landmarks by using a training set of three-dimensional organ models, which gives rise to the concept of anatomical intelligence. Anatomical intelligence applies the concepts of machine learning and pattern recognition to aid the user in detecting the organ of interest, ultimately reducing the time it takes to produce an image. It also increases reproducibility from one user to the next and also increases the accuracy of diagnosis. I will now pass it on to Nicola who will delve further into this topic of anatomical intelligence. Okay, so to look specifically at anatomical intelligence, what this system is going to do is take these concepts of machine learning and pattern recognition that we've been discussing and in turn use them to facilitate the process of medical imaging. And in order to do this, so say to help orient the user within the image or to detect the landmark of interest, the system must first recognize what's being imaged. And in order to do this, it uses a classifier. So a classifier, in the simplest terms, is going to identify which category an image belongs in. So say we have our unknown object. We also have a classifier algorithm and two potential categories. And if we run our object through our algorithm, we see that it sorts it into the category that has similar characteristics. So in this case, color and shape. Now obviously this is a very simplistic depiction of this but an actual real-life image detection system would be using hundreds, if not thousands, of different classifiers. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how this actual algorithm is working and then discuss how we can ultimately build a better classification system. So here we have an ultrasound image of a heart, and what the system will do is it will go through and segment the image, and each portion will be analyzed. What the analysis will involve is converting the image to a pixel average, average, average pixel value, uh, which is going to be similar to what Justine was just discussing in that it will compare the light pixels and the dark pixels and convert this to a numerical value. And if this value matches the range that's set in the threshold for the classifier algorithm, then the landmark will be recognized or detected. So when we say landmark, because it's going to be a term that will come up a fair bit, it's some portion of the organ that's being recognized. So this is an image of a heart, and our landmark of interest might be the mitral valve. So our image here would be positive for the mitral valve, but if we were to image something like, say, a kidney, it would obviously be negative. So now let's look at how we can improve a classifier, because not all classifiers are created equal. So to start off, when you're first developing your system, you're going to start off with a weak classifier, which is going to have a substantial error rate. However, this weak classifier is still going to be better than random guessing. So that would mean that if we were to give our weak classifier, say, 100 sample images, it would correctly categorize at least 50 of them. 
However, 50% is still not a very great accuracy rate, especially for applications like medical Im imaging where accuracy is highly important. So how do we go about making this classifier better? And this is done through a process called boosting. So boosting is an algorithm-based method that's going to combine multiple weak classifiers to make a single strong classification system. So when you're setting up this system, you're going to be running hundreds of weak classifiers over your training samples. And what the algorithm will do is it will go through and mathematically evaluate these weak classifiers and pick out which ones naturally have an improved accuracy rate. It'll then take these ones that are naturally a bit better and group them into one strong classification system. And this will obviously have imp substantially improved accuracy. So now that we know a little bit about how the algorithm's working, let's look at how it can be adapted. So once again, this is going to be under the process of supervised learning, so it will be using a training set of images where the output is known. And for the purpose of this depiction, we're going to have our orange circle represent a sample that's positive for our landmark, so maybe it's an image of the heart with the mitral valve, whereas the blue square will represent an image that lacks our landmark. And to start off, all of the samples are going to be given an equal weight, regardless of whether they're positive or negative. And by weight, I mean how much emphasis the algorithm will place on the analysis of this particular image. So if we run this through our classifier, we see that it correctly sorts the first two images, but the third image, it's actually misclassified as positive when really the image is lacking our landmark. So it's given us a false positive. And how do we go about dealing with this false positive? So this is done by increasing the weights of the misclassified samples. And this may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but one way to think of it is, say if you were to play a piece of music on a piano, and you go to reach for the sharp key, but you accidentally hit the flat. The next time you play that same piece of music, you're going to put extra focus on that one single note to make sure you don't get it wrong again. And roughly speaking, that's the same thing that the algorithm is doing. So it's going to focus more on those heavily weighted samples. And if we're to run these images through our classifier again, we see that now it's been able to correctly categorize all three images. So the final step to building a better classifier is to use what's called a cascade. And a cascade is going to be a series of classifiers where each successive one is only evaluating the samples that pass through the previous stage. And the ultimate goal of this is to reduce computation time. So once again, we'll be using our orange circle as positive for our landmark of interest and our blue square as negative. And we see at the top that we have our input of different images, both positive and negative, and we're going to put these through our first classification stage. So it will go through and pull out certain ones that it pertains to be negative. And when we're first setting up this classifier cascade, we're going to have a very low tolerance for any false negatives. So that means that the images that do get discarded, it's a high degree of certainty that those are true, genuine negative samples. Next, it's going to pull out the ones it believes to be positive. However, we see that it's actually brought forward a few false positives. And at this point, we're OK with that. We'll have a, a relatively high tolerance for any false positive, as they will be pulled out in subsequent classification stages. So we take these samples, and we run them through our next classifier stage. It's going to repeat the process of pulling out the negatives, passing through the positives. But what's important to focus on here is that this second classifier is only analyzing the images that made it through the first stage. So it's not looking at that initial input values at the top, nor is it looking at the negatives that were discarded by the first classifier. And that's where you're going to save on that computation time and reduce your processing power. So you're not wasting time analyzing the samples that were already deemed to be negative. So you can continue to run this for as many stages as necessary to achieve a detection rate that gives you an accuracy level that's adequate for your intended application. So now let's look at how the actual process of anatomical intelligence is working in an ultrasound system. And this is really a two-step process, the first being knowledge-based identification. So you'll start off with a training set of images. So these will be from hundreds of different patients and some will be positive for your landmark of interest, some will be negative. You're also going to have a separate set for validation, just to ensure that the training of the system you've done has created a system with accuracy that's adequate for what you're going to be imaging. 
So the system will go through and it will pick out all the landmarks that it recognizes and that will allow for the image to be oriented. If you then do this at a variety of orientations, you can actually build a generic model of the organ. So the second step will be patient-specific adaptation. And this is after the system has been trained, it's been validated, and it's been shipped out to the hospital where it's gonna be used. So you then take an image from a new patient and the system will go through, it will find the landmarks that it recognizes, but it's also gonna hone in on any landmarks that deviate from that generic model organ. It'll then use these landmarks to create a boundary of the organ and then use this boundary to come up with an adapted model. This boundary can also be used for certain quantitative analyses. So for example, it could calculate the volume of a tumor growth or look at the ejection fraction from a heart valve. And one thing to note is that the clinician or sonographer can go in and manually adjust this boundary if they feel that it's not adequate for what they're trying to image. So through the process of machine learning, anatomical, anatomically intelligent ultrasounds are able to be somewhat differentiated from the more conventional versions of ultrasound technology. And Namisha will now discuss how these differences can prove advantageous in a clinical setting. So as mentioned earlier, one reason to design artificially intelligent systems is to automate intelligent tasks. So the automation of intelligent tasks can actually be particularly beneficial within medical imaging, and more specifically, ultrasound imaging. That's because it not only saves time, but it also guarantees the same amount of accuracy as a conventional ultrasound system. So there are several advantages to using an anatomically intelligent ultrasound system over a conventional ultrasound system. And for the next few minutes, I will be highlighting those advantages for you. So there are three major benefits of using an anatomically intelligent system. The first benefit is that using the anatomically intelligent ultrasound can actually reduce the number of steps that are required to acquire an image. What this means is that you reduce the number of, you reduce the number of steps that it takes to acquire one single image and therefore you reduce num the amount of time that it takes to acquire multiple images. So that can lead to time savings. A second advantage of an anatomically intelligent ultrasound system is that it can be used effectively by an inexperienced user as well, uh, almost as well as an experienced user. So this can prevent the need for additional scans as well as prevent any inaccuracies in down downstream diagnoses. The third benefit of an anatomically intelligent ultrasound is that it can increase the likelihood that two different users will produce similar images. So you can increase um, your diagnostic certainty in this way. So before I expand on the advantages of using an anatomically intelligent system over a conventional ultrasound system, I just wanna go through what a typical ultrasound workflow looks like. And I'm gonna use thyroid cancer diagnosis as my example. So imagine that Susan is referred by her physician to get an ultrasound scan for her thyroid. So she will either go to an outpatient clinic or to a hospital where a sonographer will conduct her ultrasound. Now the sonographer will take the images that he has acquired and they will label them as well as perform any manual calculations that are required before presenting it to the radiologist. The radiologist will use the images to diagnose Susan's condition and then provide that diagnosis to her physician who will verify it and inform Susan about it. So there are two main areas within this typical work workflow where anatomically intelligent ultrasounds can really be beneficial. One is during the thyroid ultrasound scan and the second is during the diagnosis by the radiologist. And for the next few slides, I'll be highlighting how those benefits can contribute to aiding those two situations. So the first benefit, which is that anatomical intelligence actually reduces the number of steps that are required to obtain an image can be really beneficial during the thyroid ultrasound scan itself. So in a conventional ultrasound, what a sonographer would have to do is basically use a transducer to scan a general area to find the organ that they're looking for. They would then take the image, manually take the image, so for example, the thyroid over here, manually verify that it's correct. Also, if it's not correct, they would have to make manual adjustments and then retake the image. Now, suppose that they noticed that there is something abnormal about the right lobe of the thyroid. Then they would have to take another image, 
And that image would also have to be manually verified, as well as any manual adjustments would have to be made if it's not the correct image. Which means that between each image that you acquire, you're performing these ma manual verification and, uh, and adjustment steps that can increase the time it takes to obtain the right images. So using anatomical intelligence, we can actually reduce the number of steps that it takes to acquire one single image, and therefore save the time overall with an ultrasound scan. So how does an anatomical intelligence do this? Basically, the sonographer would take the transducer and run it over the general area of the organ. But before they had done that, they would have inputted the organ or area of interest that they want to be looking at into the machine. The anatomical intelligence will then use its auto-scan feature in order to locate the exact organ that the sonographer is interested in. Basically what it will do is it will look at the image that is being currently viewed, pick out the landmarks that are important um, to the sonographer, and then use its database of images to compare those and auto-focus on the organ or area of interest. And therefore, you can save the manual ver verification and adjustment steps that are required in between. So overall, this can lead to time savings. So another benefit of anatomical intelligence is that anatomical, anatomical intelligence ca can be used even by people who have less experience. So imagine that you have an X. So in a conventional ultrasound, you would have an expert, which is someone who is trained in using ultrasounds, but also has many years of experience using an ultrasound system. Whereas you could also have a novice, who is someone who is also equally well trained, but has less, ex less years of experience using an ultrasound system. So what happens now is that because there is a difference in the number of years that they've actually been using an ultrasound system within a clinical setting, there can be differences in the way that they acquire the images, and therefore there can be slight differences in what the images actually look like. So the problem with this is that even if you have slight differences within the images acquired, that can lead to problems with downstream diagnoses, and sometimes even the requirement for additional scans. Well, with anatomical intelligence, we can avoid that problem. How would you do that? That's because if a novice was to use the anatomical intelligence system, they could basically use the autoscan feature to acquire a very similar image to what an expert would, require, would acquire. Therefore, anatomical intelligence can be used by people who are less experienced and guarantee that they would still be able to image correctly. Another advantage of using an anatomically intelligent ultrasound system is that it increases inter-user re reproducibility. So using a conventional ultrasound system, you might have two different users. So one would be in the blue and the other one would be in yellow. And they might acquire slightly different images. And as I mentioned earlier, acquiring those slightly Im different images can actually make all the difference in the diagnosis. Why? Because after they acquire the images, they actually make manual uh, calculations based on those images that are then presented to the radiologist to diagnose the patient. So in this case, those tiny little differences can actually make a difference in what kind of diagnosis that the radiologist comes up with. However, with an anatomically intelligent system, you can actually reduce the variation between the images that are acquired by two different users. So essentially, because of its auto-scan feature and also its ability to automatically perform measurements that would normally be manually performed by sonographers, the anatomically intelligent system can actually um, increase uh, diagnostic certainty. So despite the fact that anatomical intelligence has so many benefits um, over conventional ultrasound, it actually has quite a low adoption rate within Canada. So currently, um, there is a company called Philips who is marketing an anatomically intelligent ultrasound si system. However, only 11 units are actually present within Canada at the moment. So as a team, um, one of our goals was to increase the adoption of the Philips um, anatomically intelligent ultrasound within Canada. So in order to do this, we looked into the reason why um, there's, low adop there's low adoption of that system within Canada. So basically what we were able to, what we were able to de determine is that our find is a multifaceted problem. Why? Because after speaking to key opinion leaders within the medical imaging community, particularly radiologists and managers of hospital-based imaging departments, we found that there is a severe lack of awareness about anatomically intelligent ultrasound technology. Moreover, we discovered that radiologists who have a significant influence um, 
on purchasing decisions pertaining to ultrasounds within um, hospitals are actually not likely to push for the purchase of a new technology unless they have actually tested it out for themselves. Thus, we concluded that in order to increase uh, adoption, our fix must identify the lack of awareness about anatomically intelligent machines amongst radiologists. So we determined that in order for Philips to actually appeal to these radiologists, we would need to identify an untapped market where anatomical intelligence can be particularly beneficial. So that led us to an, a market that has a high volume screenings. And from that, we chose the thyroid cancer screening market. The reason why is because thyroid cancer is actually the fifth most common cancer within Canada, with a 44% increase in incidence between 1998 to 2007. This increasing incidence rate is actually highly correlated with increased um, ultrasound scans for thyroid cancer, which clogs up radiologists and sonographer time for other scans. So we believe that in order for Philips to increase the adoption of anatomical intelligence, Philips has to address the find of lack of awareness um, by tapping into an untapped market, uh, and in particular, that would be the thyroid screening, cancer screening market. And now Sandy will describe our strategy to you. As Amisha just previously mentioned, uh, the lack of adoption is a two-part process, two-part uh, problem. So these, the uh, strategy our team proposes will try to address this, these two problems in tandem. What we propose uh, as a strategy to Philips is that they perform a clinical validation study for the purpose of providing independent data to test the effectiveness of the anatomical intelligence system in the context of thyroid cancer screening. And the reason for this is to first, um, to first get physicians aware of the technology. So how it will work is the Philips will provide uh, the EPIC-7 system to physicians to perform the clinical validation study. And this would get physicians talking, get them aware of the technology, and get hands-on uh, to the physicians. Second, generating data will allow Philips to further attune the anatomical intelligence system, which relies on pattern recognition. So as for participants, it will consist of 50 participants at the UHN hospital centers. And the reason uh, UHN was chosen is due to his large size as well as his influence in the Canadian healthcare market. Third, so the, outcome measures, uh, the outcomes we'll measure for this particular study uh, will first be the time taken for scan. So the anatomical intelligence system is actually able to help you during the image acquisition process itself. So the study will be first be comparing the, uh, the image acquisition time taken using conventional methods versus the time taken with the assistance of the anatom anatomical intelligence uh, software. Secondly, the anatomical intelligence software is also able to uh, perform some of the automated tasks that are required for thyroid, screen, uh, thyroid, uh, uh, thyroid cancer diagnosis from ultrasound images. So we'll be comparing the measurements done manually by physicians to that of uh, the anatomical intelligence system. So a little closer look at the study design. So up top there you have the patient. And so once the patient comes into the clinic, he or she is first randomized into one of two groups. Um, so they'll be either sent to sonographer A or sonographer B. Now both of these sonographers will be experts and will have the same level of experience and expertise. The only difference is that sonographer A will have the anatomical intelligence system aiding him or her during the image acquisition process, while sonographer B will rely on traditional methods. So at this stage of the experiment or our, stu our study, the outcome measured will be the time taken to scan. So conventional methods versus the anatomical intelligence method. After these scans have been done, the next part will be sort of gathering all the images and sending one copy to the anatomical intelligence systems uh, for um, uh, measurements as well as calculations required for thyroid, um, thyroid cancer screening from ultrasound. And the other copy will be sent to three different radiologists who will then manually do the same calculations required. And the results from these radiologists will be used as a gold standard to which anatomical intelligence will be compared. So the outcome measured in this case is the accuracy of measurements. So just a brief overview of sort of the, uh, the sensitivity analysis or the cost benefit of this study. Uh, we estimate the, the study to cost around $280,000. And, to, know, and uh, to note, this is a year three sensitivity analysis. And the reasoning for this is because the, Im uh, the 
requisition process in the uh, in the Canadian healthcare system. It takes about two years from start to finish in order to acquire a medical uh, device such as uh, CT sc scanners and ultrasound images. To note, it will take about Philips about three ultrasound systems in order to uh, generate a positive net revenue. So, in conclusion, just to bring it all back, um, to summarize this talk, um, anatomical intel uh, artificial intelligence is a burgeoning field and um, it'll be very important coming in the near future. So, again, it can be divided into many different subsections. Most relevant to this talk, of course, is machine learning, which can then further be subdivided into unsupervised learning and supervised learning. Supervised learning uh, can be done using a process called pattern recognition. And pattern recognition, recognition itself has many different applications, including medical imaging. So now if you just remember the question I posed to you earlier in the talk, um, how can you adapt artificial intelligence in a commercial setting in order to generate profit? The answer to that is anatomical intelligence. Before we end our talk, I'd like to um, give a few acknowledgments to these uh, individuals. Thank you. So. Hello. Hi, guys. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was just interested if you guys looked at the purchasing pathways of the UHN hospital group. Yep, we did. Hold on. How do you block it out of your mouth? So um, the purchasing pathway for an ultrasound would basically, um, in, an, in a hospital setting, um, basically because ultrasounds are priced more than $10,000, you can't just purchase it within the hospital itself. Um, you have to basically approach, so a radiologist is the first person that would have to identify a need and then approach their director um, or their manager, but the manager is actually not um, authorized to purchase anything above $10,000. So then that would go to the director who would then authorize something called an RFP, which is a request for proposal. And that request for proposal will then be um, created. So basically they have to gather all the data they need to create it. Um, and it has to be submitted to the Ontario Public um, Sector Procurement Guidelines. Um, so basically to the uh, provincial government. And then the provincial government, uh, they basically open up the bid to different vendors. And at that point, different vendors have to um, submit a proposal. And then those are considered by the hospital and the government as well. Um, and eventually uh, what happens is they choose um, one of the vendors and they pick out um, which one they think is most appropriate and they're given the contract. And this process can actually take um, up to two years according to someone we spoke to, uh, which is called, who is Jerry Placino, who's actually the manager of the radiology department at Toronto General Hospital. So that would be the purchasing pathway. And do you guys know currently um, the ultrasound systems that they're using right now in the UHN hospital system, what vendor they're from? Yeah, so um, they're actually, um, in Toronto uh, Western, they're using 16 ultrasounds, um, of which, uh, 12 of which they're actually using, but 16 of which they're, um, just have on hand. They have 16 on hand, but they use 12 in their actual rooms. Um, and those are basically Toshiba or uh, Philips, but they're not using the Philips Epic 7. They're using um, a non-anatomically intelligent system right now. Okay. And then for turnover rate, because usually for s equipments that's this large, usually they don't tend to buy them very often. Yeah, they don't. Um, so basically, uh, turnover rate is, um, it's slightly different. So um, they can buy one and they might, if uh, the lease, so usually um, the, they have a service contract and they can have the service contract be expired within three years, but most hospitals don't choose to do that. So what they'll do is they'll keep the um, system around for at least 10 to 12 years or between seven to 10 years. Uh, that is what we were told by one hospital, which is Toronto Western and then Toronto, Toronto General and Toronto Western told us they keep it between 10 to 12 years. So I think it varies between the hospitals as well. And just to add to that, some of the um, contracts that are negotiated between the ultrasound vendor and the hospital, they could include things like, you know, while the ultrasound itself might not be considered old or time for an update for 10 to 15 years, in these contracts, they 
um, integrate, you know, every time we come out with a new version or a new system, then that's installed in the hospital right thereafter. So that's built right into the contract. Right, and not only is there just the overall ultrasound system, but there's actually the transducers as well. And those are, they usually require replacement more frequently as they're more prone to, you know, being dropped or breaking. Uh, so those will also be acquired, yeah, on a more regular basis. Hi guys, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, quick question, more on the fact you're using study to validate your product. I was wondering, a little more about your study design. Like how are you going to run this? Who's going to run it for you? The cost breakdown for it? Who's going, like who's participating? Do you have more details on this? On what you propose for the study? Give me a moment. Well, I'm just I'm just trying to get a general idea. Like you just you threw a study out there, and I'm just trying to wonder exactly. How it's broken down? When, like, yeah. who's 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 going to be the person? Like, who are you recruiting? Who's who's going to be your investigators? Or how, how many patients are you going to try and recruit into this? I'm just trying to get an okay. idea of the, the, the uh, validity of the, of the study you're trying yeah. to run. Of course. So first and foremost, um, sort of this is just a pro uh, proposal. So we did do a breakdown of the cost. Uh, Phillips, just to note, Phillips has done a, a, a study related to anatomical intelligence, but this was in a cardiovascular setting, so which is a very well-known field, and we sort of designed our study based on that. So firstly, in terms of patient population, they recruited about you know, 30, 39 people, I believe. So we decided to have just 10 more people. So this kind of study, doesn't, this study isn't supposed to be like a, a, um, like a statistically powered, so you just throw a trend. And if you just look at these sort of cost breakdown, these are just the basic costs. So as alluded to the, as I was alluding to with the study design, there'd be two sonographers, so two ultrasound machines. Each of them costs around $125,000. And this is a direct quote from the vendor. Um, in addition, radiologists are paid um, in terms of a per patient basis. In, in the OHIP codes, um, the standard fee for just interpretation of the data, not the actual procedure plus interpretation, is $22.25. Uh, and it says there's 50 patients and as well two radiologists on top of the third radiologist. So that would be the cost. And the sonographer training itself, because sonographers, none of the sonographers know anything about anatomical intelligence. So you have to sort of train them a little bit in terms um, to try to use the software. And that is done usually, usually it's included within the cost of the ultrasound system. For the purposes of, uh, of this project, we decided to include a separate cost. And Philips has uh, other training modules for other ultrasound systems as well as other medical device systems. And they're all flat fees around $750. Um, on top of that, we included overhead as well, of just about 10% just to cover any miscellaneous costs. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to argue on this because I haven't done the research. I can't argue on this, but okay. I'm just wondering, is, are these the costs you use to predict that you to calculate your MPV? Yes. See, this is where I'm starting to have an issue because you, you ha when you're running a study, you have to pay, not only you're paying these costs, yes, these are set costs, mm -hmm. but you also have to include the, the, for the hospital to run your study, you have mm -hmm. to pay the hospital. Not only that, but you also have to pay them to collect the data. You have mm -hmm. to pay them. You have to pay someone to analyze the data. You mm -hmm. have to pay someone to come in and monitor the data. Yeah. So if this is what your your MPV is based off, your costs are severely underestimated here. Yeah. So what sort of we propose is that we piggyback off of current sort of um, patient load. So basically, uh, we're not recruiting outside of the hospital in terms. Of we're not going outside to recruit patients. So these patients will come in anyways, referred by their family physician in order to sort of, uh, for the ultrasound screenings. And we would record them that way, so we would offer them an extra option saying, would you like to be part of this study? And in terms of uh, the data collection and the uh, data collection and otherwise, UHN actually employs a central system. So all the ultrasound units are hooked up to the data center where radiologists are located. So any cost in that sense would be sort of mitigated in our miscellaneous cost. But you're adding workload onto the staff, and then workload has to be compensated somehow. Um, it, I get this yeah. is all part of normal routine, but yeah. this is, you're adding an additional task onto data entry, onto sonographers, and you're asking them to do extra work. So this is just normal routine, but yes, now they have to take that data, they need to enter that data, that data needs to be monitored to make sure it is entered. Yeah. So you're adding additional tasks into the hospital setting to gain data. They're not going to do this as for Sonographers free. are required to sort of manually do the segmentation. It's part of the procedure itself. So it's not any extra data sort of acquisition on the sonographer's part or the radiologist. So they're required to do those tasks. So that's why we said we piggyback on top of the current system.
Could you guys go to your slide where you're comparing conventional ultrasound with uh, with the anatomical intelligence one? I think you had like, the, all the main benefits of why it's better on a single slide. Okay, so those are some pretty bold claims to be making. Um, for sure, uh, it makes sense theoretically why you could save time and have additional scans and have greater diagnostic certainty, but I noticed your reference there is an infographic on the Philips website. So I also saw that infographic, but do you actually have the data that shows that anatomical intelligence can lead to increased time savings, additional, uh, no additional scans, and greater diagnostic certainty? Um, basically, <laughs> okay, so there is uh, not much, I mean, there's nothing much on anatomical intelligence out there, and the reason why is because it is a term that's been coined by Phillips, so we can't exactly um, find any facts on, well, even learning how it works was extremely difficult for us. So the reason why we've included this is because, yeah, we did look at the infographic, but we also looked at studies they've done like in the clinical validation study that they did for the heart, and they mentioned certain different outcomes, and that was part of that as well. So we think that, I mean, it is based off of the manufacturer, but we think that based on the machine learning and all those other aspects, it probably does have these advantages. So, okay. sorry, if you can finish. Yeah, no, okay, <laughs> okay um, so one other thing we did was we actually reached out to um, sonographers down in the States who were using the Epic 7 system, and in talking to them, one of the things that came up consistently, like we asked them, what do you like about it? What do you dislike? One of the things that came up consistently was that it does save time and does have incredibly high image quality. So we weren't able to actually locate a system in Canada, uh, but it's likely that you know the hospitals that we spoke to in the US are sort of using it for similar procedures. So while this isn't a huge sample size, uh, there is some data that suggests that it does do this in an actual clinical setting. Okay, thank you. And I also have um, another question that is, um, so removing, so in the, in the way that it, this anatomical intelligence saves time, it's actually removing kind of the expert at certain stages, right? To let the software do it by itself? To some level it is, but it's not a completely automated system. Like you don't necessarily have to follow the calculations. You can make adjustments to them. Um, as Nicola mentioned at one point, there's a boundary adaptation that happens, but a sonographer can go in and just fix the, uh, the situation, if, like if the adjustment, the adaptation, if they feel it's inaccurate. So it definitely takes in that human touch. It doesn't remove it. It just aids them in um, acquiring images faster and earlier. That's the main goal of anatomical intelligence. Just to, just to add to the point, an example would be, for example, the thyroid uh, screening process. One of the, one of the, part, of the, part of the measurement, one of the measurements included is actually measuring sort of the edge of your thyroid to the carotid artery. So what the sonographer does is after acquiring the perfect image or the right image, which takes a while manually, he'll actually uh, manually detect or click the area and then actually physically drag the mouse or, what, or the tool and actually segment that. So anatomical intelligence is actually able to detect like those areas and do it for you. And that way you have it ready as you need it. So it's very, it can save, uh, in that sense, it is able to save some time. And why did you choose um, kind of thyroid cancer as opposed to other markets such as uh, soft tissue radiography or echocardiography? Okay, um, so I guess the reason why we chose thyroid cancer is because we actually spoke to um, Dr. Karen Murphy at Toronto, um, Toronto General Hospital and Toronto Western Hospital. And basically what he told us was that um, right now there's a huge in, uh, increase in the incident rate of uh, thyroid cancer. So within their medical imaging department itself, there's a high volume of people coming in for thyroid ultrasound scans. And even though those scans don't necessarily take a lot of time, they do clog up the system. So they do take away time from other scans that happen. So we thought that if we really want to demonstrate how anatomical intelligence can save time and it can really guarantee those different advantages, uh, a market to pick would be somewhere where, somewhere where people, a lot of people are being screened and it's clogging up time for the system itself. 
So um, that's the reason why we pretty much chose it. Um, and we did some research on um, the childhood cancer um, situation as well, and there is a huge increase in um, diagnosis, uh, diagnostic ultrasound for it as well. So. Um, I actually had a question on the slide as well. Um, so you did talk about how uh, this technology would reduce the number of steps required to obtain an image. And I think you showed a picture of the thyroid as an example that you could sort of take a pan image across. Um, so I'm just wondering, I know that the technique of the sonographer is important in a lot of ultrasounds, um, particularly in the placement. So you said that there'd be less uh, need for manual verification as well as adjustment and you wouldn't have to retake images. So I'm just wondering, in uh, taking images of a tumor or a fetus, a lot of repositioning is required with multiple images mm -hmm. to t take the different dimensions. So I'm wondering how you wouldn't be required to retake images in this case. Okay, so um, basically the thing is that um, even though, exactly what you said, it all depends on the sonographer. So because it all depends on the sonographer, there's a lot of subjectivity. So one sonographer can take one picture, another can take another, and that will be very different sometimes, or it'll be similar, but there's still gonna be subtle differences. And of course, that can create differences in how it's diagnosed as well. So um, I think in terms of, in terms of um, anatomical intelligence, it actually saves that aspect. I mean, it prevents, it, it still doesn't take away, man, it, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily take away the manual verification steps, but it does, um, aid them in finding that area of interest really quickly so that then they can, manuf they can uh, manually verify it. So they wouldn't have to go through a whole process of like manually verifying it then adjust it again. Um, they would just take the image of the thyroid, then they would take the image of whatever they were looking for. It wouldn't be, or they could input exactly, if they were looking for a thyroid nodule, then they could just input that and that was what they were looking okay. for. Okay, but in the case of a, a complex fibroadenoma or a tumor, they'd have to take the, they'd have to sort of do measurements of the dimensions from at least you know, four different angles, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't reduce the number of steps required in that case. So it's not across all cases, it's just Oh, I'm not saying that cases. it reduces the number of images you need to take. Of course, for any type of scan, you would have to take like a transverse section or whatever. There's different sections you have to take, but it just reduces that time in between that it takes for them to make sure that's the right image or to have to re-image that area in the case they miss what they were looking for. So it does remove that kind of that aspect. It doesn't take away from the fact that you have to do a lot of images, it just takes away from the time it takes to go between one image to another. Okay, um, and then also the, the note about less experience being required to acquire correct images. Um, so from that as a selling point, um, from a consumer or a patient perspective, I'm not sure if that would sit well with most patients, um, and especially from a risk management perspective of a hospital. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, even from an ethical standpoint, is that sort of, th is that a selling feature that you would be pushing? Yeah, I agree with you there, but Philips actually markets them, so if you were to look at the infographic, at the very top right, I believe, they say that you really don't need as much experience to use it, so that's their marketing strategy. So it can be used by a less proficient technician. Exactly, yes. But, well, Oh, but wait, um, in terms of that, if you really think about it, if you have someone who's just graduated and they are doing ultrasounds, then isn't, that, uh, isn't it better if they were aided by a technology that could help them acquire the right images rather than not being able to do it because they don't have as much experience? No, because wh even when I get a haircut, I'd ask how many years they've been cutting their hair. So uh, would they, if they said I have some super scissors, that wouldn't really you right. know, sit but well with me. <laughs> so experience... I agree with you, but yeah. you never walk into your uh, ultrasound clinic and ask them how long they've been doing sonography for, do you? So yeah. I think in that context, it's just the idea that if you did have someone who just graduated or who has less years of experience, who will obviously be taking ultrasounds in a healthcare se setting, it would be advantageous for them to have an anatomically intelligent system to aid them to get an image that's as good as an expert. So it actually would help the hospital to prevent that risk, would it not? That's just how I look at it. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, so a lot of the uh, benefits you listed were with respect to diagnostics. So can this also be used in um, ablative ultrasounds? Um, so for therapeutic ultrasound, I don't think that the system is designed for that. So typically, I think that would need a focused ultrasound system to do that. So if I'm getting you correct, or if I'm understanding you correctly, ablative as in using focus ultrasound waves to basically, you know, do like a biopsy or something like that. Sorry, guys, 
Um, so you guys said uh, Phillips has done a clinical validation study in cardiology. Um, how has that panned out for them? Like, uh, has that worked in that market? I would say for the most part, um, cardiology is definitely going to be the largest, I would say the most common use um, of anatomically intelligent systems. Again, just speaking to the hospitals down in the States, uh, I would say two of the ones that we talked to out of four were using it specifically for cardiology. Um, so I would say that's definitely where Philips has the most data and where they also focus their marketing campaigns on. So you said that in designing, I mean, the way the purchasing pathway works in your respective domain is that um, radiologists want experience with it. Um, does your clinical validation study provide them that? I mean, or else it's just telling them, yeah, it's faster and it provides better images, but it doesn't really help them in... So yes, this clinical study would involve using the EPIC-7 system. Um, after speaking with uh, Dr. Kieran Murphy at Toronto Western, he alluded to the fact, or he told us that, you know, introducing it early into their training um, increases the adoption of the machine. So I think he mentioned that, you know, he integrated a new ultrasound machine in a hospital, Johns Hopkins, and it increased in sales from about 4% to just over 20%. So I think increasing it earlier and getting people aware of it, how to use it, then they'll be more likely to adapt that type of technology. So then you're saying increasing it earlier. Um, right now, how many, how many machines do you have right now in UHN? I mean, you're, you're saying None. your base case is three machines in three <laughs> years, right? Yeah. Am I right? The average case, most conservative. Right? Um, so how far into the life cycle are those machines? Like the, the ones that are currently in UHN or wherever you're planning this. Um, apologies. So the UHN health system does not currently have right. the anatomical intelligent Epic 7 Philips system mm -hmm. um, because they've actually they haven't really heard of it. The manager there we spoke to, Jerry Plastino, he hadn't, wasn't aware of this uh, system. And the, gr the sort of table I was showing is just to recoup the cost of the study. Uh, it would take Philips three machines. So that was the point I was trying to convey. Right now, uh, as alluded earlier, they only have uh, Toshiba and Philips, but the, none of them are anatomically intelligent, so to speak. Right, so when would they need these machines? Like, w what point in the life cycle right. do so these machines finish that you can enter the market? So they currently have you're saying you need to enter, like you need to provide experience early on in the training of the physicians. Now, to me, that sounds like that's right. gonna take a while for them to, for hospitals to take these up. When those physicians that have experience with these machines get into the hospital and then say, oh, I, would, I have experience with anatomical intelligence, I want to use it. Mm -hmm. So that was actually one of our different fi uh, finds, and we, were, we could have gone that way as well, but we chose this because we thought it was better to actually just enter a hospital and have radiologists um, use it rather than going the education route, so actually teaching them um, during their courses. Um, so speaking to the fact that um, the machine itself, like, so the turnover rate for a machine is around um, ten, uh, seven to 10 years, um, usually, so they'll exchange machines at that point, but sometimes um, if they want, they will do it after three years even. Um, so we actually don't know um, which, what part of the, uh, the life cycle the current machines that are being used by UHN, UHN are in, but we do know that it's the radiologists themselves that can actually ask for the machines and start the whole process of acquiring one, which itself takes two years. So it could take multiple years to actually put it in, but this would be our scenario, like the three years would be our scenario if it was if they were to acquire new machines and put it in an RFP, basically. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing too. It's not like they buy, you know, like 10 or 12 machines all at once. So they kind of do it on a rolling basis and replace older machines as needed. So this is why we believe that there would be a place for the new system to replace one of their older systems that they have right now. But yes, we don't really know what life cycle each machine is currently in. Um, okay, so, so the last question I have is, did you um, pitch this idea to anyone at UHN? Uh, yes, we did pitch this idea of just we, of what an anatomical intelligence system can do. And one of the actual people we spoke to outside of Asian as well was the director of emergency pediatric ultrasound at Sick Kids, 
And what they deal with is also high volume as well, as well as time sensitive patients. And they were definitely interested in sort of this type of technology and they'd really like to get sort of get to hands on experience as well. My, my question is more yeah. along the lines of would anyone at UHM want to do this? So um, Jerry Pasian actually told us that they do beta testing right now. They haven't done anything with ultrasounds, but basically they do take on like research grants from companies and they'll do beta testing. So ours isn't necessarily a beta testing situation, but um, they are willing to take on these types of studies. But of course, you would have to provide them with a grant to do it, which would be our cost. 